A very good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Tata Literature Live, the 11th annual Mumbai International Lit Fest and the first one to be completely digital, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects. This session is presented by NCPA. With the 19th century decline of the Mughal Empire and British colonial control, Muslims from hereditary musician families, middle-class Hindu musicians of Southwest, Southwest India, women from Goa's Kalavan families, and many other hereditary lineages of artists all set shop in one of the emerging economic hubs of the country, Mumbai. That added with Parsi entrepreneurial skills and Gujarati patronage for performing arts resulted in a medley by the sea for audiences from diverse class and linguistic and regional backgrounds. To discuss in these divisive times how Mumbai forged its pluralistic ethos then, I'd like to invite our first speaker of the session, India's leading tabla player, music composer and director and author of Hindustani Music in Colonial Bombay and Chasing the Rag Dream, Dr. Anish Pradhan. Thank our you speaker, for having me on this session. Our second speaker for this afternoon is scholar, translator and author of the books Musicophilia in Mumbai and Mobilizing India, Music, Women, Music and Migration between India and Trinidad, Dr. Tejaswini Niranjana. And chairing the panel discussion is a Hindustani vocalist, writer and educator, Ms. Priya Purushottaman. The session will be followed by a Q&A segment, so do send in your questions or your responses through the comment section of your viewing platform, even during the conversation. Dear audience, please welcome Anish Pradhan, Tejaswini Niranjana and Priya Purushottaman. Thank you, Veronica, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very delighted and honored to be in conversation with these two eminent authors and scholars today, Anish Ji and Tejasuni Ji. Today, we are exploring Mumbai through both of their books. Uh, we can share this with the audience who's watching, Hindustani Music in Colonial Bombay, and music, Musicophilia in Mumbai. And Mumbai has been a complex and diverse center of Hindustani music that serves as a very kind of fertile ground as the style evolved and adapted through various changes in history. In Tejasuniji's book, we see modernity performed in the diverse world of the Mumbai musicophiliac, an individual she describes who may be part of a community of listeners, students, practitioners, music collectors, patrons, and they all come from very varied religious, linguistic, and ethnic backgrounds. And they relate to each other in this new shared language, or linga musica, a notion that she puts forward of language. And this transcends these divisions and kind of manifests in shared spaces and lived experiences of listening and practicing music. So the musicophiliac really becomes a lens to understanding modernity and pedagogy and many other issues surrounding music, Hindustani music. And in Anishi's book, we have a very meticulous and detailed account of all the cogs of the wheel of the Hindustani music ecosystem in colonial Bombay, um, examining geographical and historical significance of the city, evolution of patronage systems, pedagogic methods, and the various levels of structures that were vital to building this larger culture of Hindustani music, such as music clubs, music circles, music conferences. And while delineating how all of these operated, he also looks at how these may have influenced how music is actually performed and practiced. So both of the books raise many questions about the complex evolution of the style of music and the communities and individuals who kind of shape this trajectory and those who may have also been marginalized or erased from the narrative. So in our short time today, we'd like to just focus on a few overarching themes that were common to both the books and hear the perspectives of both of these scholars Anish Ji as, a, of course, a performer and a scholar, and Teja Suniji as a scholar and a student of music herself. So I'd like to just start with the center of this whole um, talk today, which is Mumbai, the site of all of this activity. And there's a certain magnetic quality that Mumbai possesses and arguably continues to have. 
and Anishji's book uh, gives a detailed account of its vibrancy as a trade center, commercial center, and even as a port for travel, geographically positioned on the sea, and of course the railways. And Tejas Anishji's book also um, describes the emergence of this hub. So I'd like to ask both of you, um, what do you think it is about Mumbai, other than being a financial capital, would you say there's something independent or intrinsic to this region as a cultural center that made it fertile for music to flourish? Anish Ji, please. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, th I think, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Priya, f uh, uh, for that wonderful introduction to our books and, and, and the themes that we will be covering. And thank you, Tejaswini. It's been wonderful, uh, you know, to have an opportunity to speak to you on this panel. So uh, <clears throat> uh, Priya, to answer your question, uh, yes, indeed, it, uh, because Mumbai is a financial capital, uh, it has drawn uh, musicians and dancers from across the country. Uh, and likewise, I think 100 years or 150 years ago, uh, particularly post-1857, uh, uh, and more significantly in the last quarter of the 19th century and the first quarter of the 20th century, you see a major migration of musicians uh, to, to the city. And it's because of the uh, burgeoning uh, capital uh, through the commercial and industrial elite and, and also the intellectual elite uh, who played a, a, a a major role in patronizing the system of music. Uh, that's how musicians felt that this, this was a, a fantastic space to uh, reach out to potential patrons uh, after the decline of uh, princely patronage, uh, which they were, uh, they, they had an opportunity to, uh, you know, access earlier. Uh, so, Previously, of course, the, uh, the migration was on a temporary basis, but then many of them made Mumbai their permanent home. Uh, and because of the forces of uh, modernity, if, if you like, uh, through institutionalized music education, institu institutionalized music performance as well, uh, the musicians began to be uh, drawn to the city in greater numbers uh, because for, uh, because they felt that uh, this was a great, great way of reaching a wider uh, cross section of uh, audiences so I, th I think to begin with it was definitely the financial uh, capital that drew them uh, but later on the various networks uh, that operate within the music performance and education uh, 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 framework that uh, uh, drew these musicians to the city. Thank you. Uh, Tejas Niji, would you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, so I think that uh, this is uh, totally um, you know, well put. I mean, Anish has done this uh, you know, amazing history of you know, colonial Bombay and music. And although I'm not a historian, I, like Anish, I take history very seriously. And I think that uh, everything has a history, even musical taste uh, or musical capital, as you mentioned, Priya, when you wrote yeah. to us. Yeah. Um, and I think there are extraordinarily complicated historical reasons for why Mumbai became the center of Hindustani music. Uh, Anish has laid out some of these, you know, and has done so very extensively in his book as well. So I just want to add one more thing to that, that the multiple migrations uh, into Mumbai during the 19th and 20th centuries created a metropolitan unconscious. This is the term that I use in my book. Uh, so the metropolitan unconscious uh, is for me a vast repertoire of experiences, of habits of living that includes what music to listen to and how to respond to it. So this metropolitan unconscious is not an individual or a personal unconscious, but a collective one. And we draw on it as inhabitants of Mumbai as we learn to live life in a modern city or learn to live a modern life in the city. So I want to bring in this concept and also to say that this is what the musicophiliac, uh, also a central concept in my book, as you mentioned, uh, or the diwana. Uh, what does the diwana do? That he or she is drawing on this metropolitan unconscious when they respond to music. 
So as Anish pointed out, there's a, a huge ecosystem of music that's created, which is economic as well as aesthetic. And in that, you have also the uh, an important role played by uh, what I'm calling this repertoire of experiences. Yes, that's a um, very interesting point because the kind of center of our talk today is definitely about this idea of multiplicity of experience. So this metropolitan unconscious seems to be a space where a lot of um, the experiences of music and lived and in the body as well as out in other realm seems to kind of come to the fore. So I, that kind of leads us into our next question, which is about this fabric of Hindustani music. Um, in your book, they just need to, you, you describe in detail NB compound, for instance, near Kennedy Bridge, where many hereditary women performers lived and entertained patrons and listeners. And that may not have been a space necessarily frequented by Hindus, for instance, but because of the, the culture of this music, many people would cross their boundaries and go to these spaces for, to experience those. Um, and Anish, in your book, you also speak about, um, in music schools, for instance, the diversity of interactions that happened when students were taken from various religions or communities, Saraswat, Gujaratis, Parsis, Bodhis, and so on. So I, my question would be, um, Anish ji, if you think there's anything specific about Hindustani music as an art form that attracts this kind of diversity of practitioners and listeners. In the, in the, in the system of music itself? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I think, you know, every, every art form um, has uh, various doors through which you can access it. Uh, and it's, it's the same with Hindustani music as well. Uh, I have to say, uh, to add to what Tejaswini said about the metropolitan unconscious, that while, yes, there is this collective uh, experience, there is this collective memory also, uh, up until the 1950s, I would say this was pretty much an elitist uh, uh, collective memory, if I, if I might put it. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, you, you had different areas of the city uh, for let's say mill mill workers who were who were accessing let's say tamasha or those kind of uh, you know folk theater or folk music dance etc uh, so so it's not that everybody in the city was suddenly flocking to uh, Hindustani music concerts, whereas with more and more ticketed concerts and more and more access to uh, uh, larger venues thanks to amplification system also coming post Second World War, uh, you had the possibility of reaching out to a wider audience, you know, uh, I mean, previously, you had music circles who could only, uh, you know, entertain uh, between 80 to 125 uh, listeners at a time. And um, uh, um, Tejaswini has uh, so wonderfully staged a series of concerts at the Lakshmi Bal, uh, Lakshmi Bagh Hall in in Girgaon, where I too have had an opportunity to play a few times uh, several decades ago. Uh, but uh, after you have large venues and even open air venues, uh, you have several several hundreds of people, and that's when you actually reach out to a diverse uh, audience. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I think uh, and I think the the diversity therefore in the audience is not only because of the music, but also because of the various other paraphernalia that allows larger number of, numbers of people to gather in a in a specific venue. Mm -hmm. Now uh, addressing the the idea of the music itself um, allowing more and more people to come in. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, you have, for instance, the sacred and the secular being addressed in, in, in the system of music. So, so you can uh, engage with it at different levels. You have multiple forms of vocal, instrumental music. Uh, once again, you know, if, if somebody is not uh, engaging with vocal music, you still have instrumental music which, which can uh, provide whatever level of excitement you're looking for. Uh, so then you have the lyrics which which you may or may not understand 
so because there there are multiple languages that that are being used there, primarily North Indian uh, languages. So I, I think there are many many access points for this uh, for the audience to engage with this, and, and also you know with so many uh, levels of dissemination with recordings and uh, radio and television. uh you have so many ways of reaching out to a wider audience right they just need you would you like yeah. to share uh, yeah, i i i again i agree with uh, anish's uh, description of the transformation in the nature of the audience and perhaps its democratization you know on a much larger scale after forms of amplification came in i think that's totally right uh, but i do also want to say that um even if not in the form that we know it today the melodies of hindustani music uh, had reached a far wider audience because of the sangeet natak uh, in marathi and because of the parsi uh, gujarati theater yeah so even in the 19th century because they used the light forms of hindustani music uh, people become literate in these melodic forms and uh, they it's a, a much like you know a, a broader a spectrum of people than just like you know a few uh, you know members elite members of the society so i think that one needs to remember the sedimented history of that uh, as well like how do you become familiar with these and of course you know as we come into the 40s and 50s you have the hindi film music which is drawing on the same melodic forms as well so it's a, a huge spectrum and i do uh, want to mention that but um in addition i just want to say that um uh you know i've been talking about the listeners in mumbai in my book and uh, the, i think uh, priya you already mentioned and uh, venessa did as well that uh, in girgaum which is a center of music as a native town we had uh, you know gujarati speaking lower and middle class patrons uh, they were mostly hindu some parsi konkani and kannada speakers some from kalavant families some uh, chitrapur saraswats who are part of the cultural geography of the bombay presidency uh, courtesans and tawaifs of different religious backgrounds speaking different languages uh so when we talk about diversity in the audience we are looking at partly linguistic diversity religious diversity and also to some extent class diversity as well uh just to give you one example from my book uh, there's a story about nb compound you know ganga bai's compound when uh, you know there was an all night uh, concert going on there were many musicians in the audience both muslim and hindu and an ra milk truck came and stopped there at about 5 in the morning because the man had come to deliver milk he stopped the truck outside rushed into the compound and prostrated himself in front of uh, the singer who was performing the bhairavi at that point so this is of course one anecdote but you know since we don't have access to a class wise breakdown of who was you know like accessing music at the time i think that uh, we can build on some of these stories to figure out the probably that you know hindustani music did reach a wider audience even if they did not identify it as hindustani music i think that the the forms the melodic forms as i call them are far more familiar than uh, you know we we perhaps uh, acknowledge yeah that that anecdote it was a very lovely anecdote in the book and i think that really um like you mentioned shows the breadth to which perhaps hindustani music has filtered through the city and it seems as you both have mentioned through technology through allied art forms it's had a kind of larger um space over which people have had access um going back to ganga by that who you're just speaking about i'd love to hear uh, they just need your thoughts on all these women who you've really beautifully described in your book ganga by of course the famous tawaif and patron figure from nb compound Gangu Bai Hangal the of course celebrated vocalist who hails from Devdasi lineage Dhondutai Kulkarni who also trained from of course famous the famous Kesar Bai Kerker who learned from who herself has come from the Goan Kalavant community and Lalit Rao ji who is a Saraswat Chitrapur Brahmin who learned from Gharana Ustad so in these stories we see the various ways in which women have gained entry to the system acceptance as performers and a shift in this kind of patriarchal period of the gharana that reigned for some time i'd love to know your thoughts on um where you see this kind of trajectory of women's evolution um because for a long time it seems like the gatekeepers of this tradition are largely men and they've both enabled and 
at some point disabled and reframed the way in which it's acceptable for women to participate in this musical form. So what, what do you see that trajectory has been and where we are now? Yeah, so let me show you this uh, picture from my book. Uh, can you see it? Oops. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So here is a, a, a Tawaif and a Devadasi, as I like to imagine them. This is from a, an early 20th century postcard. Um, so I think that uh, when we ask a question like, where are women today? Um, and I think as you already you know, begun to, to give me a possible answer, that uh, you need to look at the diversity of the performers themselves. Like, who were the performers, historically speaking? And the earliest would have been, of course, the Devadasis who moved uh, to Mumbai to learn Hindustani music, and the Tawaifs who, uh, as part of the dispersal of the Mughal Empire, also ended up in places like Mumbai, where, um, as Anisha's book so wonderfully describes, they, they also you know, were unacknowledged uh, you know, students or pupils of uh, the Ustads, very often because they learned from accompanists and not from the Ustads themselves. Uh, but they provided, you know, the, through the quotas, through they provided spaces for young musicians, they provided uh, nurture, they provided, uh, you know, uh, help of different kinds and contributed a huge amount to the, uh, to the, the emergence and the establishment of Hindustani music in Mumbai. Uh, that's the historical part, of course. And it was only about the 1930s that you have larger numbers of middle class women uh, coming into Hindustani music as students uh, and eventually also as members of the audience. So since my focus has been so much on uh, listeners and divane, I've also often asked myself, uh, can women afford to be listeners? Can women afford to be these musicophiliacs, the mad people who travel all over Mumbai at any time of day or night, uh, sleeping over in concert halls, catching the early milk train, if they had to at the same time, you know, be looking after the household and making sure that, uh, you know, breakfast is ready or dinner has been given to the children or whatever. So I, I think that I also mentioned in my book that uh, even in the earlier part of the 20th century, there were people who uh, contributed in different ways to the, um, to, to building up uh, and both an audience for Hindustani music as well as making sure that the musicians were able to flourish. So from there to, uh, you know, be a different kind of, uh, you know, divane if you like, that they are um, also trying to learn music. Uh, that definitely starts happening to a large extent after the 1930s. And to my knowledge today, there are thousands and thousands of women learning music. And there are no fewer than the men who are learning music. But it's a huge, like we're talking from the 1930s to now, right? And I think it's very difficult in the short span of time that we have to figure out what might be the reasons uh, why you have now so many women. But again, asking about the diversity of the performer, I think that you begin to see a homogeneity in terms of the class cast background of the women performers today compared to, uh, you know, 100 years ago or 50 years ago. And... Uh, you know, let's see if the conversation takes us in that direction, maybe I'll, I'll have more things to say. Mm -hmm. But to say that, you know, in, when we say, uh, where do women stand today, I think we also have to ask ourselves which women. Right. Anishi, would you like to share any yeah, I, yeah, I pretty much uh, agree with uh, whatever Tejaswini has said. I just, uh, just a little point that I'd like to make is that uh, you know, uh, when the when the early migration took place, uh, uh, and the the possibility of concert opportunities in the city uh, were emerging, it was primarily the women performers, the Tawaifs, uh, and later on the uh, uh, women from the Devdasi community, who were the soloists, and the men were primarily either teachers or accompanists. It was only later on, first in private concerts and, and then in the music circle, uh, music club and music circle uh, circuit that you find male vocalists and instrumentalists uh, getting a platform to perform as soloists. So uh, while it was pretty much a patriarchal kind of uh, uh, situation, yet the women performers were uh, reigning supreme, supreme uh, to begin with. Uh, so, so, uh, so I think th there are a lot of gray areas also, and yeah. uh, and of course also when we 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 talk about patriarchy, we need to also uh, you know uh, think of the fact that 
the uh, the the male community of musicians hereditary or otherwise uh, is not a monolithic framework so uh, you have soloists you, within the soloists you have vocalists first on the uppermost uh, pedestal then you have uh, instrumentalists i mean this was the traditional way of looking at uh, at at musicians hereditary musicians and then you have the accompanists and so it it's almost like a caste system and indeed uh, each of these in different eras have had uh, names associated with them like kalavans mirasis dhadis etc etc so uh, many of these uh, um, you know changed once once they were in this metropolis so so that's how the metropolis has also impacted uh, social groups within uh, hereditary musicians as well uh, so so we need to factor that in uh, when, when we are talking about male musicians too yes so I, I just remember to add to that that uh, to the earlier point anish made that the earliest recordings uh, gramophone recordings were by women from courtesan yes. backgrounds yes yes and i remember in your book anishi you really detailed even the payment earlier in the reigning period of the women performer the disparity of uh, payment between the co accompanists and the then the slip happens also highest paid uh, among the male musicians so uh, he would get something like 500 rupees you know Uh, and then the tabla player or sarangi player would get 75 or 100 whatever depending on whoever uh, the the status of that musician whereas kesar bhai was getting 1500 rupees you know so mm. so here's a here's a woman mm. musician uh, but because she had that stature you know so uh, that uh, that made all the difference in in the uh, payment to uh, of fees to her so obviously this is, is not a universal truth that not all women were pay, being paid well or all all male musicians were being paid so uh, well so uh, i think we need to uh, factor in uh, that there are there are many uh, gray areas once again yeah it's definitely not a kind of linear history of these communities yes. i think um so I'd like to we'll switch gears a little and hopefully if we have time we can come back to this because I know Tejas Nidhi also mentioned an interesting topic of which women we're talking about it would be lovely to explore um but before that if we can speak a little bit about spaces because um this our talk is of course about Mumbai and even in both of your books you identify many of the spaces in the city that are really historical sites for Hindustani music but of course now we are in the digital <laughs> this critical moment of history we're on this whole festivals online hindustani music concerts are almost completely online teaching has been online already but now probably drastically even more so so my question for both of you is um how do physical spaces still matter and do you see that cities and spaces are going to become obsolete or as the digital space increases in its importance they just we need you want to go yeah. for that <laughs> uh, okay i can start um yeah so the it's interesting you know when first the the pandemic took uh, you know deep root and everyone went online um i somehow thought that you know since one has been i have been studying music online for many years now that it's not going to be so different and i can transition to all kinds of teaching and learning online but i think although um, hindustani music has been well prepared for it many other forms of learning and teaching haven't so it's it's been as a teacher has been quite a struggle for me to uh, somehow transfer my own experience of learning hindustani music to uh, other kinds of teaching and learning situations priya you ask about physical spaces and do they still matter and i think that you know as we have you know increasingly come to see in these last several months the experience is a different one and if it continues to be only digital uh, that i think uh, it's going to be quite different the sound will be cleaned up and will will be accustomed to all these lags the interjections of appreciation will be probably missing uh, the real time appreciation is like you know you're not going to be able to see that but i think it's still too early to say what the immediate future holds 
because I think we still have the infrastructure of cities and buildings and uh, all the things that we have been used to in spaces of performance. Uh, although the pandemic has uh, prevented us from accessing those spaces, they still actually exist. Just as in my book, uh, I've been documenting the spaces that are perhaps not used today, but exist. So that very existence, I think, uh, you know, is quite meaningful and quite significant. And we need to think about what the consequence of that will be if the spaces exist, even though we've all gone digital. I'm sure Anish would have lots to say about this. I actually interviewed him about his experience of teaching digitally. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, yes, I, I have been teaching uh, digitally uh, for a few years now, intermittently, and uh, more so now than before, of course. Uh, but, you know, yesterday uh, I was listening to a, an old recording of Bari Gulam Ali Khasab. <clears throat> and obviously it had been recorded from somebody in the audience. Okay. So <laughs> you can hear more of the audience appreciation than uh, the main vocalist or the instrumentalist accompanying him. And, you know, you can then, you know, zero in on audience reaction. They were holding on to every word every melodic twist and turn, every uh, thing that the accompanists were doing. And, and that is such a rewarding experience to musicians, you know, because finally it's, 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 it's live music that, that we are doing and, uh, and it's, it's a performing art. So, um, and, and the audience reaction is so in, integral uh, to something like this, you know. It's, it's not pre-composed music that uh, we're reading and, and just playing, you know. So, so, so uh, however much I may say that, okay, I'm going to shut my eyes and not let audience reaction influence my performance, it really doesn't work like that. Obviously, the audience, you can decide, you can make a judici judicious decision on how much you want the audience to dictate your choice of repertoire or which uh, route you want to take in terms of the elaboration. Mm -hmm. But once having done that, you still need uh, a live audience to uh, really, because this conversation is, uh, I mean, music making is a conversation. And mm -hmm. the conversation happens, of course, between the members of the ensemble, but also between the ensemble and the audience. Uh, because finally, you're trying to communicate your innermost feelings to uh, to different people. Otherwise, I may as well sit in my bedroom and and make music, you know. <laughs> so uh, right. and 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 so I think uh, you know the digital space, uh, of course, is is empowering in one way in these uh, trying times, but at the same time, uh, it is constricting too. So I can't wait to tell you the truth. I can't wait to get out there and, and meet people and make music together. Yeah, <laughs> I think that raises a really interesting point about uh, improvised music in particular, perhaps being a different kind of exchange that really involves the audience in a way that maybe pre-composed music has a, a different audience artist relationship. Um, so speaking of audiences that kind of brings me back to what we began with today about this whole idea of diversity, plurality in Hindustani music. And again, your, both of your books talk about audiences and the importance of the listenership. So again, kind of related to what you just mentioned, I have a question about diversity of the audience and how that does it impact the experience of listening, first of all, for a listener, if you're in a homogenous audience versus a very diverse audience, does that change the way you experience the music? And as a performer, having an audience that is diverse, does that also have a, any kind of a different impact on the way you would perform? Because we keep prioritizing diverse audiences, I'm just interested to know why, why that is important for the art form. Tejas Sunidhi. No, I think Anish should go first. This is okay. okay. Uh, yeah. How does it matter to the performer to have a diverse audience? Yeah. So as a performer, Priya, I, I, I feel that uh, audiences are always diverse. Mm -hmm. Whether they are small in number or, yes. uh, or really large audiences, they are always diverse. And that's why a performer should never take audiences for granted. 
mm. uh, uh, which is not to say that you need to cater uh, mm. to uh, one listener or 100 kinds of listeners but i'm just saying that you need to uh, you know tell yourself repeatedly that you know uh, you can't just say that oh this is an audience of uninitiated listeners right. this is an audience of initiated listeners right. i mean even in a music circle context not right. everybody really understands rag tal etc mm, uh, and and uh, earlier of course uh, in the 1930s or 1940s yes you may have a large number in the in the audience who did understand uh, nuances of rag tal but once again uh, from uh, from the interviews that i have conducted with people uh, i can tell uh, that uh, you know the the responses were not uh, similar uh, so 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 uh, audiences have always been uh, diverse and uh, I think that that is the greatness of this uh, uh, a system of music like Hindustani music, you know, that that it is inviting uh, diverse listenership. Uh, and uh, as I said right in the beginning, that now more so than than before, that it's also crossing class boundaries, caste boundaries, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, and gender uh, boundaries too. So uh, it's it's wonderful for a performer. To, to reach out to multiple kinds of mm, listeners. It's difficult. I know it's difficult. I mean, if you have a sammelan which attracts, let's say, 15,000 people, you know, uh, you can't really please any everybody. And 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 if if you if you are a sensitive musician, I think then you you would have already told yourself that you're not there to please everybody. You're you're there to communicate what you are going through, what you're feeling what you're emoting and whether the other person wants to uh, receive that uh, at some level uh, you leave it at that that's like any other conversation like the conversation we are having today right and from the audience perspective do you think that the experience changes when their co-listeners are more heterogeneous as opposed to I mean, I know you mentioned it's already diverse in different ways of measuring the yeah. diversity, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you know, when you have a, a, a homogeneous kind of uh, listenership, sometimes it can be trying to, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, then, let's say you have people who are really getting into the grammar of the music, uh, and, and then they lose out on the emotive, the expressive. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, not saying what, I'm not saying that one has to be against uh, you know, contrary to the other, but but uh, sometimes you do come across listeners, you know, who, yeah. who get into the nitty gritty of the grammar or oh, this rag and this tal and you know, and then they just forget the 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 larger picture that the, yeah. that the performer is trying to paint. Yeah, yeah. Tejasaniji. Yeah, I'd like to um, add the following that I think that it does depend on what axis of diversity we are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, are we looking at class caste diversity? Are we looking at gender diversity? Are we looking at linguistic diversity? Because all these have mattered in different ways at different mm -hmm. times in the history of Hindustani music. And additionally, now we, we need to ask whether we're talking about physical audiences or virtual audiences, right? It's going to increasingly become a feature of, uh, you know, both listening and performing. Uh, also, whether listening is a collective act or a solitary act. Because right. if it's the former, as I stress in my book, if it's a collective act, then surely it matters who we are listening with. I think Anish already made that point. And it matters what connections we form with each other through that act of listening. So before we had Zoom audiences, we had YouTube. And there too, I've been noticing this listening communities emerge. You know, when someone puts up a particular, you know, like a, a new recording, someone, as the same people comment on it. But in virtual audiences, it's harder to figure out who's listening. So I often speculate about what's the background of someone who comments on you on a YouTube video. And I do notice that many more people with male names comment than women do. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there was All India Radio's classical music programs before independence, uh, sorry, after independence. Uh, and many people I interviewed for my book uh, were deeply impacted by the All India Radio program. So, but I don't know who was listening. You, you know that many, many people were listening. There's no comprehensive research about musical audiences along all these vectors of diversity I mentioned. And I think that that work really needs to be done. So we fall back on stories and anecdotes, which is what we have. 
but uh, and I just want to add uh, what I mentioned earlier in a different context. When we say diversity matters for the listeners, we still I think need to ask the question whether di there is diversity among performers, which mm -hmm. is where we are today, right? So I think uh, this is something maybe you could speak to or Anish ji at a later point. Yes, I, I think Anish, if you can, this would be great too. As we have just a few minutes before the audience questions, so where uh, there's been a lot of discussion about, um, I mean, we hear in the Carnatic music world, for instance, discussions around diversity in their performership, especially regarding caste. Um, what is happening in in your eyes in the Hindustani music among the diversity of performership? Is there any so, way? Yeah. So uh, uh, among the hereditary musician families, uh, you know, they, they had their own hierarchies, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and yet uh, they were marginal, mar marginalized communities uh, in the larger spectrum of uh, Indian society. Uh, and, uh, and now, of course, we have, let, let's say, somebody like me, a first generation musician, and and I assume, uh, I, I, are you also a first generation musician, Priya? Yes. 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 So so I, th I think uh, the past hundred years, so much has happened. Radical changes have taken place in the in the manner of music education and performance that people like us uh, have had access to this uh, body of knowledge uh, and 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 have then been able to with uh, the encouragement we have received from our families or 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 our gurus uh, we have been able to take this uh, forward as uh, as a professional uh, uh, you know as, as a as a profession or as a, as a career mm -hmm. um, uh, and i, I think uh, definitely therefore we do have uh, people from diverse backgrounds coming in as performers today. Uh, you don't just have hereditary musicians. In fact, you have very few hereditary musicians. Yes. Uh, I was going to actually ask you about, but I don't think we're, <laughs> we have too much time yes. left. That's a whole other topic of yes, yes. Um, um, the a lot has been written about how many heritage musicians have kind of become more critical in the narrative. So how that shift has happened in the kind of makeup of performance. Yes. Uh, are we ready to go for the Q&A? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, if you'd like, we have probably like 30 seconds, but it's a huge topic, so perhaps yeah, I think I, I think we've we pretty, pretty much uh, covered it, and, and yeah. also uh, women performers. You you have so many women performers, you know. So right. so I, I think indeed uh, now the, the 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 divide between the hereditary and and the non hereditary has changed considerably yes. uh, in in today's world. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think we'll now transition to the Q&A from the audience. Thank you so much, dear panelists, for that very interesting conversation. We've got questions from YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and the schedule, the website, Tata Lit Life. Uh, the first question we have is, Will music and the arts always need financial patronage or can they become self-sustaining? If any of our panelists can take that question. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, I, yes. I didn't. Will music and the arts always need financial patronage or can they become self-sustaining? Uh, I, th I think... Uh, you know, patronage to the arts is, is very important. And, and what, what is self-sustaining? I mean, uh, if, 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 let's say I do a concert and, and it's a ticketed concert. It's still patronage at some level, right? I mean, you have people buying th those tickets. So, uh, uh, you know, we have this kind of idyllic picture of musicians, uh, you know, just, just uh, uh, singing away, you know, and 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 uh, playing uh, their instruments without uh, a care for their tummies, you know, and uh, and this is such a terrible 
uh, way of looking at the arts now, i think i think uh, uh, more than ever before this pandemic has has uh, you know brought home this truth that um, artists across the board are not really regarded uh, when it comes to uh, such situations right from the uh, state uh, you know when uh, the, the governments or or, or big um, industries or whatever else you know there is no long term policy about how to handle or, or how to support this section of society because we don't we are not regarded as daily wage uh, uh, workers we are not regarded as salaried employees so so what do we do you know uh, uh, i mean and it's all very well to for everyone to say spread positivity you know with your music spread positivity i mean uh, it's like you know some sort of sandwich spread you know and uh, <laughs> i mean how long can we go on you know two mm -hmm. months three months four months nine months you know uh, and and it's ridiculous and even and even now we don't know what's going to happen in the uh, coming months till till we have the vaccine so so i think the rest of society really needs to think about how important the arts are in their lives when they when they consider that will they then consider how important are artists right so patronage is not only important financially but also culturally you know looking for music beyond just entertainment and supporting it i suppose ஆர்டிஸ்ட்ஸ்மாலர்ஸ் Uh, and so many of us try to help in some way or another so we are looking at support for the arts and the support is not for something that just needs to be done because art is a public good but because if you look at for example there i've seen some statistics about the kind of time people are spending online on so called entertainment music apart from netflix that is right uh, we are talking about music we are talking about learning music online we are talking about so much of people's online life that has to do with engaging with music and performance but in terms of what people are willing to pay or support it's very low in terms of the list of priorities so i think that if you are drawing so much emotional and other sustenance at this time from music and performance then you should be willing to support it i'd like to ask uh, in the same vein what about um initiatives where like crowdfunding or patreon where artists are trying to remove this funding structure is that a possible uh, alternative i mean i mean yeah, definitely those platforms are empowering uh, but you know we don't have really uh, proper statistics in place about yeah. how this thing is really unfolding i mean yesterday i was uh, watching uh, uh, we bought a ticket to to a concert which was not a hindustani music concert it it was a kind of fusion concert and how many people do you think across the world were watching that you'd be surprised it was a one hour concert just 361 people mm. okay and uh, and for hindustani music you can have anything between 20 and 70 people on an average okay yeah. we talk about you know tejasvini we are talking about collective conscious and you know all, all these things but it has all disappeared and i understand that there is this kind of uh, digital fatigue and everything you know and it's not the same for live performance uh, and also because you have now access to so many youtube recordings of the same artists so people feel okay why should i then you know go uh, pay something for for a ticketed concert so there are these problems too uh so i i think there's no one answer uh, mm. of how to negotiate this situation but i think people really need to put their heads together indeed in fact we have a question which probably takes us one step be behind uh, we have a question which asks 
corporate funding is a big source of support uh, but corporate sponsors do not necessarily know much about the art form so what does this do for the diversity of hindustani music and the appetite of the listeners of for hindustani music anybody uh, Pejaswani? Pejaswani? Uh, well, uh, I think the people on the ground, as far as this is concerned, are really Anish and Priya. So they should be answering this. Okay. My own documenting of what's happened in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, everyone I've talked to has said, every performer has said, that corporate sponsorship has changed the very format of the, the performance, the, the interest of the performers, because free tickets are given away. Uh, and uh, people just like maybe take the passes and don't show up. So the level of interest of the audience may not be quite the same. And there are a lot of constraints on how long you can perform, what you can perform. And uh, the other thing that's been told to me is that uh, the corporate sponsors like stars and they will not then support the hundreds and thousands of, uh, you know, really wonderful young musicians who are coming up. Uh, so there is a lack of larger support when you only look for one kind of source of uh, funding and not uh, support from a live audience, as Anish has been saying. But I know the, the performers on this panel will have a lot more to say about this. Priya, do you want to say something? Um, uh. um, I just, this reminds me actually of something that you wrote about in your book about the when the patronage systems changed and then the artists were modifying their repertoire to meet that. Um, when businessmen um, became bigger patrons in the Mumbai music scene, for instance, and then um, Previously, maybe it was more strictly Khayal, and then they began to reincorporate um, Thumri and other forms. So it's interesting because perhaps this is not a huge change. What we're experiencing has been happening through all of the phases of this arts evolution. That's just a, something. Yes. There's, there's only one, uh, one additional feature, and, uh, uh, <laughs> which sometimes can be an un unfortunate one that with the um, corporate uh, sponsorship, uh, uh, particularly after the 1990s uh, with liberalization, you had this entity uh, by the name of event management company or event <laughs> managers. <clears throat> and while it is good to professionalize uh, the, 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 the format of uh, music making and, you know, ha have everything professionally laid out, have, uh, you know, the right sound system, the l right lights and everything, uh, good stage uh, requirements, good green room, etc., etc. Not all of which, of course, are met with even by the event managers. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, these event managers, uh, unfortunately, they started, uh, you know, um, fashioning themselves as curators. Mm. Uh, and, and they are so ill-informed about the music that they are actually uh, putting up there. And, and so once they became curators, uh, they decided on who to uh, select for, uh, for the performances, what kind of repertoire they should uh, you know, I've, I've come across event managers who, who tell the performer, oh, sing this Thumri, because that's the only Thumri he knows, you know. <laughs> that's the only Thumri that that curator, the, sorry, the event manager knows. But, mm -hmm. uh, but it's for the performer then to decide whether or not to give in. Right. And, and, and unfortunately, many of the performers give in just to gain that concert opportunity. Yeah. And perhaps the cost of not giving in is also quite high for a person who is trying to just establish themselves. Would you say <laughs> that uh, is a risk? Well, uh, it's how you look at it, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it would be self-righteous on my part to say that I wouldn't do that. Uh, but really speaking, I wouldn't do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have an interesting question here. Um, how do you assess Hindustani music meeting local Marathi folk scene, the Abhang form of Tukaram and other saints, when it came to Mumbai? Uh, maybe the writers on our panel can give their opinion on it. I think Anish, you should go first. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there, was, there were multiple musical forms uh, in the city, uh, obviously because uh, multiple communities were gathering here. You know. 
Maharashtra. So from the north, uh, from from southern Maharashtra, from Karnataka, from Goa, etc., etc., and they brought with them their own musics as well. And so obviously, uh, at some level, there was uh, some influence. And and of course, uh, they didn't need to come to Maharashtra to have uh, have an interaction between the devotional, uh, what we call devotional music, and Hindustani music, because this was already happening. You know, I mean, you look at the history of Hindustani music, and you see close ties between, let's say, Qawwali and Khayal. Uh, you, you you see close ties between Haveli Sangeet and uh, khayal drupad so uh, in terms of the lyrical content and in terms of also uh, sometimes the the melodic and rhythmic elaboration uh, uh, to to speak uh, uh, about the abhang uh, um, a lot of the um, marathi speaking vocalists here uh, they took to singing uh, abhangs as part of their Hindustani classical uh, uh, concert repertoire. So maybe they, they would do a khayal, then a tumri, and then uh, an abhang or, or a bhajan, Hindi bhajan or a Marathi bhajan. So that has happened. And now, of course, you have uh, Hindustani vocalists who do entire Santwani. I mean, Bhim Senjoshi was, of course, iconic for, for his um, uh, Santwani programs. And people who, who emulate that, uh, continue to do that. Yeah, and I'd like to add here that uh, as far as Karnataka is concerned, uh, which is also part of the Bombay Presidency and which has so many, so many major Hindustani musicians, uh, people like Malika Arjun Mansoor and others started singing the Vachanas in Kannada. Yes. Uh, so it wasn't just a Marathi tradition, but many kinds, as uh, Anish pointed out, that went into the making of uh, a repertoire for Hindustani music. And of course, if you go back, if you look at the Deccan Plateau and you go back many hundreds of years, you look at the influence of Sufism, which has yes. again impacted not the formation of a classicized form of music, but uh, really local devotional forms have interacted with various kinds of Sufi music as well. We have a subsequent question to that. Uh, how do you feel about Hindustani music marrying Indian film industry in mid and late 20th century? So, uh, so right from the, uh, from its origins, uh, film film music has uh, attracted um, Hindustani musicians, uh, both as sessions musicians, uh, first as uh, musicians who are employed in uh, with various production companies, and then uh, and as composers for films. And later on, as sessions musicians, uh, and and that continues even to uh, today. Of course, now with synthesizers and all manner of digital uh, formats, there uh, you don't have so uh, so much of the uh, traditional acoustic instruments being used, uh, unless uh, there is a particular demand from from a particular uh, composer or or specific song requiring that. Dr. Niranjana? Um, no, I don't have anything to add here. I think we're running out of time, so I'm a little conscious. Oh, don't worry about it. I think uh, we should have the last word. Uh, pardon, please? I you should have the last word. I, I will just be uh, taking up the questions with you. Um, Ms. Priya Purushottaman, any closing remarks regarding uh, the discussion and the discourse at large? Yeah, sure. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground, but yet there's so much more that we could have discussed. And both of these books are really um, important scholarship around issues in Hindustani music. So for all the musicophiliacs who might be watching this talk, definitely engage, encourage you to engage with these texts, think about these topics, because um, as we've seen from our discussion about around diversity, around complexity of histories, that we really have to have many more conversations probably like this in much more detail to, to deepen our understanding of this complex musical form and its, its history. So I'm very grateful to both Teja Suniti and Anish Ji for participating in this conversation today. And hopefully we'll have more such opportunities. Thank you very much, Priya. Thank you, Tejaswini. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you to the festival. Yes.
Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, your time and your insight is very valuable to us. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Audience, you can check out the books mentioned in this session at tataclick.com. The next session you can quickly hop into is The Good Doctrinal, beginning in the next 15 minutes. The, to know more about various other sessions and book launches for the day, you can check out the festival schedule at tatalitlife.in. This panel discussion was presented by NCPA. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you so much for being with us at Tata Literature Life. Have a wonderful day.